Load monitoring supports applied decision making by offering a structured view of the fitness fatigue paradigm from Banister et al. in 1975. So this helps optimize the training stimulus to adaptation ratio. How much training do, you, do we need versus how much adaptation can we get from it? Okay. This enables real time and longitudinal management of the performance injury nexus. Okay. So too little load is under preparedness. They're not fit. Right? They, they, they can't hang on the pitch, they, can't, um, they don't have the strength or they don't have the endurance or the speed endurance, whatever the quality of importance is. Too much load and now there's heightened injury risk. We're pulling hamstrings, we're tearing groins, okay? we're getting Achilles tendonitis, uh, we have injury risk and we have diminished returns. A lot of effort for very little gain when maybe they should be recovering. And so it's essential for what we call adaptive periodization, meaning um, periodization is the cyclical planned approach of layering one fitness characteristic upon another to um, get the athletes to peak at the right time period to avoid overtraining and to ensure preparedness. Now, if we just plan it out and follow it to the T, we can't be as adaptive. And we know in team sport, where we have so many individuals all working for the same goal, we have to be very adaptive, especially when we start thinking about um, individuals on the team. Uh, we can't just have them do the exact thing that we've written down six months ago uh, because we, we can't predict everything that will happen. And so this allows us to be very adaptive in our programming to keep the periodization on the right track. Now. Um, the key objectives of load monitoring, okay? Uh, we aim to balance training efficacy, so are we doing what we're supposed to be doing in training, with athlete durability. Is the athlete um, reducing their injury risk and are they uh, meeting the physical qualities that we need them to meet, okay? And we try to do this by optimizing the dose response of the adaptation um, along with the athlete's readiness and their recovery state. When we're mitigating injury risk, uh, we have some strategies like acute to chronic workload ratio, um, which, you know, there's, there's some, I, I guess, back and forth in the literature about how useful is that metric. Um, and we're not going to get into a lot of the, the finer points of things like ACWR today. Uh, really, I'm just trying to give you guys um, just an overall context for load monitoring. Um, but just know that things like ACWR, which is essentially a comparison of your previous either 14 days or sometimes 28 days of training, your, uh, that would be your chronic training workload, to the acute training workload, um, the last seven days of training. And so, you know, the theory goes or the concept goes that if you have too high of, of a ratio, too high of an acute to chronic ratio, you increase your potential for injury. Meaning, if you have a ton of training in this week, in this last seven days, uh, versus the last rolling 14 days or the last rolling 28 days or however, however you want to calculate that, then that's, that represents a spike in your training workload. And that spike, your, your organism, your body might not be ready for that spike given what it's done in the recent history. Okay, And so it's just a way of estimating injury risk. And there's a lot of different ways to calculate it in the literature. And you can use things like total duration or total dis distance covered or player load like um, we do with Catapult. We do that with our soccer team here at the, at the university. Or you can do it with something like high speed running. So only uh, distance covered over a certain velocity. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat on that one. We also want to maximize performance by aligning training intensity, volume, specificity to the sport demands, okay, using both objective and subjective indices. And this really reinforces a systems-based approach, okay, where monitoring is embedded in a larger performance model. So we're not just we're not just out there prescribing random sprint sessions. We're not out there saying, oh, you know, I don't know, coach, what do you think? Do we have time for a few more? Um, we are being methodical. We're being scientific so that when we are tracking using GPS, uh, we can be making those decisions based on quantitative data and then make better decisions about training. All right. Now, how is it actually measured? We're going to talk mostly about GPS today, but there's a few different ways to measure training load and it depends on the sport as well. Um, uh, modern load quantification, it merges physiology uh, physiology and technology. Okay, we, we take the tech, we measure, measure the physiology, and then it captures it via the analytics so that we can make decisions. 
When we're looking at external load, this is going to be GPS for anything involving distance, high speed running, accelerations, etc. We could also track load using force plate and bar tracking for, re for res resistance training. You know, maybe, maybe you have um, a power lifter, they're in the gym. Okay, we're not going to put a GPS on your power lifter because the GPS map is going to look like this, just walking around in the gym. You know, maybe even not a lot of walking, maybe they're sitting on their favorite bench and they're scrolling in between sets, although we know that there's research that says that that might decrease output on the next set, um, so maybe keep them engaged. Um, but you can use it for like impulse, for area under the curve, uh, you can look, use bar tracking for getting displacement and volume load, etc. But that's for another, another lecture. And then we have um, IMUs, inertial measurement units for mechanical workload and contact slash collision data. And the best systems use both GPS and IMUs so that we not only get distance, but also high speed running and acceleration, and we get impacts and G-forces and all of that. We measure internal load. Remember, internal is the perceptual and the, physio uh, the physiology, okay? Uh, we use heart rate variability, we can. Uh, we use session RPE. I should have put heart rate in there, just normal heart rate. We could look at lactate, hormonal markers, um, and then subjective fatigue and readiness scales. Okay, this reflects the principle that training the interaction of work and response, uh, or training is the interaction of work and response, rather. It's uh, neither input alone explains adaptation. We can't just have output or uh, um, the internal load. We have to have both of them. That's, that's the best because then we can triangulate multiple variables. We could look at player load, we can look at high speed running, and we can look at heart rate, or we can look at session RPE, and we can look at the number of accelerations per minute, and we can look at total distance covered. Whatever it is that within your framework makes the most sense and gives you the most actionable data, but it's going to take some playing around with some of those metrics and maybe reading the literature as well, hopefully, um, to give you a good guided approach. And so for the sake of time, I'm going to go a little bit faster through some of these more conceptual slides because I really want to get to the, um, the practical slides as well. But just know that really we're looking at uh, relationships between the external load and the internal load and the resultant effect on adaptations. Okay, here is that fitness fatigue model and, that we, and we can see that uh, after training, that, that box showing training, we can think of that as a single session or we can think of that even as maybe a season or a block of training. Fitness is very high right after training but fatigue is also very high. We see fatigue on the uh, negative y-axis and as fatigue dissipates, thankfully our organisms work in such a way that fatigue dissipates faster than fitness dissipates. And so the time horizon for adaptation uh, to actually improve performance is whenever that fitness outweighs the fatigue and the athlete is then more prepared for performance, we would say.